Namaste everyone and welcome to our session on literary theory. This session is titled Literary Theory and the Journey of Ideas. Well, we are going to take a deep dive into the topic and look at uh, literary theory very, very clearly and crisply. I know that many students when we are in our undergraduate or postgraduate classrooms and this topic is introduced to us, we tend to be confused and we tend to be overwhelmed with, uh, let's say, the topics, the ideas and we are not quite really sure what literary theory is all about uh, right so in this session we are going to be looking at each of the aspects in very very clear terms and we are going to understand what exactly is literary theory right so i've uh, formulated this lecture as literary theory and the journey of ideas uh, because it's actually a tradition which is 2000 years old and uh, when we talk of literary theory in this particular session we mean uh, European or European originated literary theory and we are not really sp uh, speaking of let's say uh, oriental traditions Indian traditions Chinese traditions and how we look at art and how we look at literature so we are basically considering the ways in which the culture in Europe and the West has looked at art for about 2000 years. And with this, we start. What exactly is Western literary theory? It is an inquiry into the nature and function of art, which means that we ask questions into what is the nature of art? What does art comprise of? And what purpose does it serve? These are the two questions we ask when it comes to knowing literary theory. And so, to answer these questions, we ask five broad questions. The first one is, what is the source of art? Where does it originate? Second, is art useful? Does it serve a purpose? Third, what is the nature of art? We'll deep dive into each of these questions individually. Fourth, what is the nature of an artist? Who is an artist? Is he a madman or is he like an inspired seer? Does he tell the truth? Does he tell uh, lies? What does an artist do? And fifth, how does art bring us closer to the truth or does it uh, bring us closer to the truth? Right. So these are the questions that we are going to answer. Appreciation of poetry and art is linked to appreciation of information that is stored in art forms. Much of that information is subjective to the age and context and hence dependent on the people living in the age and context. Hence, appreciation of art is linked to uh, appreciation of subjective realities of people. And this is a very important aspect that we need to consider when we are studying literature and culture of any kind. Because literature and culture basically help us encapsulate the subjective realities of people which might be very different uh, to us or which might be very similar uh, to the reality that we are living in right now. So it is basically an appreciation of uh, aspects of reality and perspectives of reality that we might not be that familiar with. That is what literature and art primarily does. And that is my perspective on it. You might have another perspective. So literary theory explores this relationship between truth and beauty. So for you, for those of you who are John Keats lovers, you uh, might remember those lines uh, beauty is truth and truth is beauty uh, well he summed up summed it up very beautifully to him to john keats truth and beauty well uh, whatever truth is there in the outside world or uh, you know if you are if you are kind of an introspective person whatever truth is there inside of you is expressed in a beautiful form of art or poetry so literary theory basically explores this beautiful relationship between art and there are three facets facets to it. There's a, a larger universe that is basically outside of us, right? Then there's an artist who uh, wants to encapsulate or capture that universe in, 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 in the form of art. And there's an audience. So the artwork ha also has to interact with an audience. And so then we move on to understanding this relationship between universe, audience and artist in relationship to art through these four theories given by M.H. Abrams. And M.H. Abrams simplified literary theory into these 
four categories. The first one is mimetic theory, second one is pragmatic theory, third is expressive theory, and the fourth is objective theory. Now, what exactly is mimetic theory? This one is the most common. You might have might have heard of it. So, mimetic comes from the word mimesis, which means to imitate, right? So, uh, this one says that the art actually imitates the universe or the reality outside. And hence, art can be judged uh, how well by how well it imitates the reality in the outside world. For example, a still life painting or a painting of a landscape. So what is the measure of a good art? It will tell you that, you know what, if, uh, if, if your art captures your reality perfectly, uh, what is exactly there outside is exactly there on the canvas or on the sculpture or on the page, then it is a good art, then it is a good mimetic art. For example, your photograph, you know, some, uh, so um, there have always been fans of good mimetic art, right? And it might be accurate to present the point of view that people started uh, making art as a form of mimesis, as a form of recording history. And that is where uh, recording history and memory studies comes into play because uh, art as a form of mimesis and culture ha as a form of mimesis has been relevant since, let's say, human history started. Right. The second one is expressive theory and uh, this is something also that we would relate to. So this theory is primarily concerned with the relationship of art and the poet's internal world. So we often say that uh, artists are one of the most expressive and sensitive people. They tend to draw or they tend to write whatever uh, they f they're feeling in the moment or they are expressive beings. So art is seen as an expression of poets inner life, making it is, uh, the most subjective take on art. Now the problem with this, uh, or let's say the perspective on this kind of theory is that the subjective realities may be too different uh, and it may be too abstract for the other person to know. So when we come to visual arts like Impressionism or let's say Expressionism, in, especially in the 20th century surreal paintings, we see this expressive theory of art in action, right? So the third one is the objective theory, which well, I would say that this is a very, very unique perspective on art as far as the European theory, uh, literary theory is concerned, because it was formulated only around 19th, 20th century. And we are going to delve into each of these topics in detail in the upcoming videos. Uh, so stay tuned. But for now, we just need to know that the objective theory basically said that the art is an organism in itself and it is governed by its internal rules and structures. It is self-contained and a self-referential artifact. This theory makes art to be a self-enclosed entity. That means it is not affected by the world outside. It does not really refle re reflect on the artist's emotions or the audience's emotions. It just has a rhythm or a pattern of its own. You know, it's, a, it's, a, it's an organism of its own and it needs to be studied according to its own rules. For example, I'll just give you a broad example so that you're not left hanging in the dark. For example, uh, poetry has to have a certain meter, meter. It has to have a certain rhythm. It needs to have, a, you know, certain, there, is some, uh, there are things called illusions, which mean it needs to have references to whatever it has said before. So uh, you must have heard of... Uh, Oscar Wilde's quote that, um, you know, all art is basically useless, you know, so it, it is kind of related to the objective theory, which means that the art doesn't really serve any function in the outside world. It does not really even serve function for the artist, you know, it does not really help the artist express himself or herself, or, and it, it, it does not really, um, you know, serve any function in the outside world. But it is a beautiful thing on its own. It is a self-enclosed object on its own. And with this, we end the session. In the next set of videos, we are going to be looking into each of these theories and how they originated uh, into quite some detail. So stay tuned. Thank you for watching.